live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Good evening and welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm Katherine Reed, your host for tonight, and we have a very exciting show. In keeping with our show of last week where we talked about the meet and greets that are being organized and sponsored by the League of Women Voters, we also have some of the partners of the League who are also working to organize and support these forums that are upcoming in Fairfax County to help voters meet, engage, ask questions of, and really get to know who the candidates are before Election Day on November 3rd. Our first meet and greet is actually going to be a broadcast here at the studio. Mark your calendars for Monday, August 31st from 7 to 10, and you'll be able to meet and hear from your candidates for Senate and the House of Delegates um, here in Fairfax County. So tonight, my first guests are Olga Hernandez, who is the former president of the Fairfax League, and the current executive director, Beth Tudan, who is joining us via Skype. Welcome, Olga. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We really appreciate being able to get this information out to the community. The League has worked to organize 13 events around the county. We have 99 candidates on the ballot this year, so this is a monumental effort. Um, we have divided the county into three regions, the eastern, central, and western regions, and basically sort of organized it by magisterial districts to be able to cover all of these offices. We have the entire General Assembly, the school board, board of supervisors, and all the constitutional officers on the ballot this year. So that's going to be a big um, election, and we want to make sure that everyone um, knows. The details are all on our website where you can go and find out the exact location of where your candidates are going to be in your area. Uh, our executive director can t tell you a little bit more about the, um, the, the specifics, the the specifics <laughs> the on specific. our website. So if I give you all the details right now, you're not going to be able to follow them. The first one will be, as uh, Catherine said, on the 31st of August, which will be right here. And it'll be a uh, live audience, so you can attend that too. All those details are on our website. Beth, our executive director, can uh, talk a little bit more about what we have on our website. Thank you, Olga. Yeah, so we, as she mentioned, we are going to have 13 and greets in fall. Can you hear me? And so two are going to be recorded live at Fairfax Public Access on Inside Scoop. And the public is invited to phone in questions for that. Also, 11 are going to be held across the county at various locations. So you're going to be across all the magisterial districts. All of them are free and they're open to the public. Um, we have 99 candidates who are running. Um, and it's basically the idea is to give the public a chance to ask questions. And we would like high school students to come, some who are in government classes, also some, um, any college students or whomever, anyone, um, retirees who are interested, um, that who would like to volunteer. So we're, we have this on our website. We have the calendar of all the meet and greets. We have the, um, a list. We have flyers of each one. We also have the um, a volunteer link, so a sign up genius for each one of those where any of you are welcome to um, come volunteer. So, and again, it's going to be people, and the locations are anywhere from, of course, Fairfax Public Access, which is in the Merrifield area by the New Mosaic District. We have them at several libraries, at various county office buildings, and also um, a new community center, and at one of the high schools. So we'll have the um, candidates for the Board of Supervisors, and um, Soil and Water Commission, Clerk of the Court, um, all of the different Fairfax County school board members and such. And that's available at our website is www lwv-fairfax.org, or you can search for League of Women Voters at Fairfax meet and greets and you'll find it. Thank you, Beth. I really you. appreciate it. And the reason that we are doing this is, again, this is the biggest election 
in Fairfax County and across the state where everyone is on the ballot but the, the lowest voter turnout each um, year. Right. And so we need to make sure that people are informed and we're going to give you the opportunity to meet some of these candidates and get to know what, they, what the office does uh, and so that you can ask questions and you can evaluate the candidates. Um, again, we've divided the county into three regions, mostly by magisterial districts, to be able to accommodate all of these candidates that are um, going to be on the ballot. The, um, the House of Delegates and the uh, State Senators will be again on August 31st here in the studio here. And they will also be invited to participate in the regional areas. The, um, the league really is nonpartisan. We just want to give everybody the opportunity. I also want to let you know that closer to the election, most of our survey answers will be posted on our uh, platform, vote411.org, where you can see where candidates answered the same question, so it'll be easier for you to compare one candidate to the other. It's our voter's guide, and we, are, uh, we work very hard to get as many of the candidates to respond and be able to post that online so that you can search that. It's also a portal to be able to check to see if you're registered, if you have moved or changed your name. You may need to do uh, some updating about that. Remember that in Virginia, we now can uh, register to vote online. You can also update your information online. As long as you have a DMV address, you can complete the whole registration online. If you do not, you can still go to the online um, uh, link and print out the form, sign it, and mail it in. Do it now. It gets, uh, you know, the election Hectic. will be here Hectic. really uh, soon. And uh, also, um, they will be opening the absentee voting. You can apply for your absentee ballots now if you're not going to, if you meet one of the qualifications to be able to vote absentee. You can also vote absentee in person uh, as long as you meet one of the qualifications. And there will be sites all over the county to be able to do that. And, so. and are those locations on your website? Can they find those? Those locations are on our website too, where the county um, has um, different, ma many of the magisterial offices will have a site. Right. Uh, not, not all of them, but many of them, but always at the government center that where the uh, election office is. So let's just back up a second because we keep using the term magisterial district and let's yes. not assume that people know voter, what that means. Voter supervisor district, right. which so is whatever, your magisterial right. district. Right, so that's Drainsville and it's Springfield and it's right. Hunter it's, Mill. It's and Mount so Vernon, Lee, Mason district fall into our eastern district. Uh, the central district we qualify as Braddock, Providence, and Springfield. And the western districts include Hunter Mill, Drainsville, and Sully. Right. And so there's a, a supervisor that represents each, each of those. Each one of those. And they're districts. all on the ballot this time. All on the ballot. Except for two that are retiring, and those uh, are open seats. And those are open seats. That's uh, Michael Fry in Sully, and that is Jerry Highland in Mount Vernon. Exactly. And so those seats uh, have non incumbents. So it's an open race. And, so. and I will say, historically, because I want to get back a little bit to the, the genesis of this, is that the League of Women Voters has been around since 1920. Pretty yes. much women got the right to vote, and then the League of Women Voters started. And we, we actually formed to educate And you are doing women, that to this day. To educate women on how to vote so they would not be a rubber stamp of their husbands. Mm -hmm. But we educate everybody Absolutely. because we believe, you know, that and voters should be informed, and we try to provide nonpartisan, strictly nonpartisan information to anyone who wants it. These meet and greet opportunities are where you can actually touch the flesh and ask the candidates your questions directly. 
You can listen to what their platforms are, and it's better than just reading a website. It absolutely is. You can is. absolutely meet them and get a feel for what the person is going to do for you. And you have been doing this for over 20 years. We've been doing this for a lot longer than I've been around. But you personally. I personally Two have. decades worth. I, I personally have. And this is extremely important because, again, as I said, this election of these offices, the, your entire General Assembly, it's 140 seats, um, the entire Board of Supervisors, Board of Supervisors school, board. school Boards, sheriff? the Constitutional Offices, yeah, like our sheriff, the yeah. Sheriff, the Clerk, Clerk of, of court. Courts, Soil and Water Conservation, and many people are not entirely sure what the Clerk of Courts does or what Soil and Water does, but these offices actually impact your life a lot more than the presidential election. We will get almost 80% turnout in a presidential, which by the way, that's next year. We'll work on that later. But, but in this election, the General Assembly sets all the policies. We're a Dillon rule state, and so right. they set the policies. But your school board sets the policies of what your neighborhood schools are gonna be doing. Board of Supervisors are very important. They set your property tax rates. So if you are concerned about that, if you're concerned about transportation, pay attention to who, who's in the House of Delegates and who's right. in the State Senate. Soil and water, if you're concerned about the environment, which we all should be. We all should be. They, they are uh, very active in that. So um, these are, this is the biggest election in eight years because the uh, clerk of court only runs every eight years. That's true, and, <laughs> and, and you're absolutely right about that. So people have differing, the House of Delegates is every two years, Senate is every four years, Correct. we have a one-term governor, which is an off-year election. Right, and the clerk but he's of the not court, on the ballot this year. <laughs> yeah, he's not on the ballot this year, and so it's, it, I think it is an opportunity for, um, for people to come out and, and meet. Exactly. Uh, other uh, the candidates, and you mentioned kind of briefly that we don't have a top of ticket, so there's no senator race. There's there are no, no and that makes it tails. right, and so that makes it one of the lowest turnout and, races. And we, and in all fairness, we live in Northern Virginia. We get more news about what's happening in Washington than we do what's happening in this county. Because our local news, and this is, is where, our national news, and this is where we hit the road because. These candidates and these elections get very little coverage in the local media. Well, I appreciate you doing this. I really appreciate Beth. Beth, thank you so yeah. much for joining okay. us. Um, you mentioned something about the school board being up for election, every member of the school board. So okay. we're going to have two guests next from the Fairfax County Council of PTAs. And they are partners with the League of Women Voters. And so I hope you'll join us after the break as we meet Debbie Kilpatrick and Kathy Detrick of the Fairfax County Council of PTAs. And we will talk further about how important it is for all of us to meet and greet the candidates. Remember to vote November 3rd and be prepared. You need a photo ID. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high-interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent. Like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit asha.org. 
You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I am your host, Katherine Reed. Joining me in this segment are two very important people from the Fairfax County Council of PTAs. We have the current president, Debbie Kilpatrick, sitting next to me. And next to her is Kathy Dedrick, who is the president-elect of the Fairfax County Council of PTAs. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. So you, um, you ladies are here because you are partners with the League of Women Voters. In these meet and greets, there's a lot of organizations around Fairfax County who've gotten actively involved because clearly we want an informed electorate. We want a higher voter turnout. So, so kind of explain what your relationship is to these elections and to the people running. Well, with the uh, upcoming elections for school board members, uh, the board of supervisors as well, uh, it's very important to us that our community is well informed about uh, what is important to our families that live in the county, uh, education, uh, quality of life. And so it is our um, mission to be sure that our community is well informed and that we keep education as a focus of that mission. So. so how long has the council been active? I mean, my kids went to Fairfax County and Fairfax City yeah. Schools, and I had a local PTA, right? So Virginia mm -hmm. run PTA, Daniels run PTA, but I don't remember being connected or engaged with the Fairfax County Council of PTAs. Oh, and, and I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, we actually, uh, our council has, I don't know how long we've been in existence, but probably 30 years plus. Uh, we, have, we actually represent 175 uh, schools in Fairfax County uh, that are PTAs. Okay. Uh, we represent over 50,000 members wow. throughout the county. Wow, that's huge. Uh, we're uh, also um, chartered by Virginia PTA and National PTA. And uh, National PTA has over 4 million members nationwide and international. And uh, so by being affiliated with a state and national association, we're able to offer many different programs and different um, opportunities to our members that live in Fairfax County. Just to give you a little update too, Fairfax County Council is the largest council in the state of Virginia. Oh, that and makes actually, sense, because our school system is the yes, largest. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. So we're very engaged. Uh, Northern Virginia has very engaged parents, especially Fairfax County yes, Public School do. engaged. Mm -hmm. Yes, they definitely. Do. So so that gives you just a little background. Uh, also, uh, PTA is over 118 years old. We are the largest child advocacy association in the world. And so having that advocacy, it's a, just a natural fit that we want to come in and make sure that our families become engaged in this uh, election process and so that they can make very informed decisions when they go to the polls. Yes, so. that makes sense. And that's where our advocacy comes in. A lot of people don't know that National PTA actually is responsible for starting kindergarten in public schools, oh, wow. the lunch, school lunch program in public schools, juvenile justice programs in public schools. So we ad our advocacy involves not at, only at the national level, but at the state level and at the local level, which is why we're here <laughs> today. And, and I can understand you said something about your interest in, in the, the supervisor's race because obviously the school board budget is the biggest line item in our county's county budget correct and there every year that becomes sort of the headlines in the news whether you have children or you don't have children in the public school system the fact that such a huge part of our county's budget goes to our public school system yes. and that's one of the um, issues that we have been facing as a council over the last several years um, 
And last year we decided to take some action and uh, we joined uh, the Invest in Fairfax Coalition. Oh, yes, I do. I know it and, well. And that is made up of uh, uh, teacher associations, uh, faith-based uh, organizations, uh, county government um, employees associations, and our council. And we felt it was very important that the FCPS budget and the county budget somehow work together so that we could really address all the issues that all of the county residents are facing. Mm -hmm. And um, we have continued to build that coalition. Uh, we have um, uh, in, uh, increased the members in our group. We have testified at the, the public hearings. hearings. Mm -hmm. uh, we are always there uh, speaking up on behalf of education. Uh, the well-being of students, the quality of life in Fairfax County, and uh, we will continue to do that as we move forward. So I guess as part of your advocacy work, it makes absolute sense to, to put your efforts, in addition to Invest Fairfax, run by a wonderful group of people, um, behind the League of Women Voters' efforts to create these this, these opportunities for engagement. I think when we say meet and greet, it sounds kind of like a cocktail party, but it's an opportunity to actually engage in an interactive way with the people who are running for office. Right. Well, you just uh, saw the Republican uh, meet and greets. Yeah. <laughs> so this is much, much smaller, obviously, yeah. on a very local level. And we're nonpartisan, apolitical, uh, so we don't advocate for either side. But we do want to hear what their platforms are, especially when it comes to public education. So this is a natural fit for us uh, to partner right. with the League of Women so, Voters. So you're really doing issue advocacy. I mean, when it comes to, you know, at, like moving the start times of the high school back or full day kindergarten or... Well, we, no, we, we leave that to FCPS. <laughs> okay. Well, we, and we have positions on that that our members have voted on. But our, our main goal is that uh, we, uh, and Invest in Fairfax uh, mission goal is one county, one vision, mm -hmm and one future, because we are all in it together. And so we have to work together. And uh, we have uh, reached out to both the Board of Supervisors and to the school board, um, and Dr. Garza, of course, we are in constant contact with her. And so it is just an ongoing um, consensus building um, association that we just want to be sure that we are doing what's best for all kids in Fairfax County. So you serve as sort of a communications channel then for yes, well. parents who may not be plugged into this every day the way you exactly. are to make sure right. that you're highlighting. We're informing them mm -hmm. of what, who their board of supervisors are, who their school board members are in their magisterial districts, and asking them if they have an issue with anything, they need to go and testify uh, because they're, they're very welcome. To do that. So do you basically uh, deal with the um, representatives from each of these 175 yes. school systems? Yes, we have a great communications tool that we um, communicate with each president and their officers and some of their committee chairs of each PTA. Uh, we have leadership training that we offer throughout the year. We have events that are focused on diversity and inclusion. We sponsor the Fairfax County Spelling Bee. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. How yes. about that? Yes. And we also offer um, uh, Reflections Arts uh, program, which is open to pre-K through 12th grade. And it's an opportunity for every child to express their creativity in six different categories, or artistic categories. And it's also open to our special needs students so that we can celebrate all of their accomplishments. I have always loved that program. My yes. daughter well, you, participated. You know she wrote a poem when she was like in second grade at Virginia Run and That's was included great. in the reflections. Good. And there was a, so I do remember that. Great. And I do think, and I'm a, I'm a big proponent of the arts. You know, a lot of people talk about STEM. I talk about STEAM. Right. Absolutely, yep. and we do too. Yes, a, we do too. yes, STEAM, very critical. Not STEM. Yes. Yeah, and so I, I love the fact that that Reflections Arts Program is in fact one of your, one of your well, principal it, programs. Well, it's one of our principal programs. Mm -hmm. And um, we had over 500 participants last year, uh, students from every grade level that participated. And uh, it's just a you know, it's rewarding to see the what students are able to create. 
And it's a way to showcase these um, artistic students and their creations in a different venue, in a different area, and other than in school, although well, it is partnering with the school. So tell me, Kathy, yeah. um, what is the Kathy Dedrick uh, incumbency going to look like once you take <laughs> over and you go from being president-elect to president? What is the Kathy Dedrick uh, platform going to look like? Well, I'm going to hopefully maintain and, and retain the same programs, reflections, um, the spelling bee, uh, our training. But in addition, I would like to emphasize a little bit more of a turn on literacy. I'm, I'm really sure that we need to push that, especially, you know, pre-K through th third grade. Third grade. And just trying to engage greater engagement with our diverse communities with, and it, be more inclusive which we're trying to do now. We're trying to be as inclusive in all our programs and across the board in everything that we do. It's been, been very disturbing to me about the third grade reading scores and the, the um, school to prison pipeline. Yeah. You know, yes, and I'm, yes. I'm sure you all are very familiar with yes. that. But that third grade reading score seems to be quite critical. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that they do a lot of testing with the kids, but I'm of, of the mind that there are other ways to bring up literacy levels than just producing more reading tests. And the big way is family engagement, and especially getting these more diverse families to engage more with their um, students. It's very difficult. Two jobs, you know, they're I know. super busy. Mm -hmm. But I think when you set the priority, or hopefully this is what I'm going to try to work on, of your child's academic success, um, you will find the time to read with them every night or to read a book, you know, a story every night. And just that little bit of 15 minutes, you know, it doesn't, difference. and it can be in, in their in their language. Being a Hispanic, I totally uh, um, encourage the culture, uh, staying with your culture and learning your culture. But you need to teach your children to read and appreciate reading, and just the act of engaging them in that way will lead to the better success in their academics. I think so. I mean, we are a very international county. You know, there, there are people who have differing opinions about that. I tend to be of the opinion that the great international community we have in our schools is a benefit. Children Absolutely. sitting next to other children who come from different countries, have a different culture and different experiences, right. enriching exactly. for the environment. Yes. And we that happens learn. with parents as well. When they come together for our leadership training, or we've had best practices for Title I schools to, because they have different challenges of engaging their parents. And so we've had that, those type of events. And the feedback is they really appreciate getting to know what other schools in their similar situation are doing to engage families. Best practices. And our, our big focus, we have a best practice um, for our Facebook. We do have um, a council Facebook page. We also have one dedicated to best practices. We have one dedicated to advocacy. Uh, we have our website, which is www.fccpta.org, which is inclusive of everything that we offer. We have references, resources. It's a place that uh, we want um, the community members to come and, and visit. Well, and we, to we, find out we really appreciate you guys being here. Thank You've you. given us great information. Debbie, Kathy, continue to work on because I think the fact that we have such a huge school system, 175 PTAs, clearly you've got a handle on how to reach these people, raise these issues to the level of parent attention. So thank you so much for supporting the League of Women Voters as well. Thank you. Join us after the break. This year, 28,000 Americans will be diagnosed with oral cancer. Every year, 7,000 Americans die of oral cancer. I'm Eva Cohen, and I'm an oral cancer survivor. I didn't fit the profile. I didn't smoke or drink. I had no family history of cancer. No family history of cancer. I was 31 years old. 31 years old. I went to see my dentist about a sore in my mouth that wouldn't heal. It was oral cancer. I had to have a radical neck dissection and a portion of my tongue reconstructed. I didn't know if I was gonna live or die. I'm Surgeon General Richard Carmona. The survival rate for oral cancer is only 50%. Oral cancer can happen to anyone. If you have a sore or lesion in your mouth that doesn't heal within two weeks, see your dentist. Early detection is the key. Early detection saves lives. I know. 
One in eight Americans goes hungry. One idea helped change that. A community started a garden that blossomed into farmer's markets. One in six children lives in poverty. One group of women found an answer by opening a daycare center that their neighbors could afford. Today, 36 million Americans live in poverty. But one by one, people are helping themselves and each other to change the picture of poverty to one of hope. For easy ways you can help, visit PovertyUSA.org. Two words for you. Pop quiz. Ready? Name any funny movie. A drama. Name a mystery. And one more thing. Name the movie your kids saw today in science class. Know what really matters. Know about your kid's school. And know about your kid. Find out 100 ways to know more, do more. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. I need a job. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Catherine Reed. I am your host for Inside Scoop. Joining me in this segment are two wonderful women. We've got um, Sandy Lawrence and Patsy Quick on the end. They are the co-presidents of the AAUW of Virginia, which is the American Association of University Women. And I think, Sarah, you have been involved since 1973. Patsy has. Patsy has, yes. and you've been involved since 2001. One, correct. So how old is the organization? How long has it been around? It's been around since 1881, um, empowering women and girls, and currently we have 170,000 uh, members and supporters throughout the country, um, and we do a lot of great things at the national level. We gave out just recently over $3.7 million in fellowships and grants wow. for women um, working on their um, doctorates, post-doctorates, going back to school. Uh, we have a legal advocacy fund where we donate finances and organizational support to cases that are significant to women, uh, such as the Walmart case, uh, military victims uh, for so, uh, sexual harassment, which is one I'm very interested in, and the um, uh, college and university unfair pay act and unfair pay practices. Uh, we lobby Congress. We have volunteers that do that every Thursday, help get the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, the uh, Matthew Shepard um, Hey Discrimination Act right. and some of those Take done. Law, yep. And we also do a lot of research uh, papers that are highly respected reports. We just did one on why there's so few women in um, uh, computer science and and engineering. So that's at the national level. Patsy, talk about what we do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, at, um, at the state level, uh, we have over 1,200 members in 26 branches around the state. Uh, 11 of those branches are in Northern Virginia, seven in Fairfax County. Uh, we partner with... Yeah. Wow, seven <laughs> in Fairfax County. Seven in yes. Fairfax okay, County, that's right? news to me. Yeah, uh, we partner with 26 colleges and universities in the state. Um, we have two major conferences every year, one focusing mainly on leadership and the other one more like a convention where we have workshops and speakers and other activities that interest our members. And we um, provide information for our branches for public policy advocacy around the state on the issues that are important to us. So one of my fellow Rotarians, Dr. Sarah John, who's in my Rotary Club, is a member of AAUW, and she's always collecting books for the big book sale. Many so, big Falls books. Church. Yes. Falls, Falls Church. Falls Church. Yep. So, so we are, we're, we're aware of that work. And then I run in, when I go down to session, when uh, the General Assembly's in session, I have run into members of the AAUW yes. who are there for lobby days. That's and right. in fact, with this year, we raised over uh, 1,200 signatures on a petition that we gave to the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, the speaker of the house on human trafficking. We were trying to get laws that would um, help the, the survivors of human trafficking, which we didn't get, but we finally, Virginia finally passed a law that had law legislation on the book against human trafficking. We were the last state in the nation to have that. So so we go down there every year. We do proclamations for equal pay, uh, for human trafficking, and um, we do a lot of, we registered over 600 voters last year. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So your involvement with the League of Women Voters seems like a very natural fit because clearly women make up, I think, 52 percent of the mm -hmm. population of Virginia, but we don't always come out and vote in those numbers, which means that sometimes the outcome is not what it could be mm -hmm. if more women actually were informed, came out and voted in every election, 
you know, and we're, we're far more aware of what the issues are. I mean, I often say that, you know, I've had previous programs about childcare regulation in this state and the fact that we don't have paid parental leave. I said, you know, 83% of our legislature is men. So these things do not disproportionately affect them. They disproportionately affect women and families. And so I think the work you're doing is really impressive. What about your relationship with the universities? How do you bring people into the AAUW? Well, we have uh, representatives who talk to them and, they, and work with them through the national organization. Uh, being a partner with AAUW means that you have access to particular programs that are uh, set aside specifically for college and university, such as ELECTOR, which is uh, the only national um, uh, program or workshop designed to help women learn how to become uh, be elected on campus. Oh, right. And great. That's great. Hopefully for future political office. Uh, there's also uh, Smart Start, which is a way uh, we help uh, grad college graduates negotiate for equal pay. So um, those, those are the kinds of programs that we're working with with <coughs> college and university, in and addition to having free membership for students who are oh, that's a wonderful. member. And we have very good relationship with Our George partners. Mason and, and Nova, yeah. the different campuses. Great. So we have done equal pay events. Uh, the past three years at George Mason. Uh, we've talked to them about how to negotiate for pay because the women, the first year out of, out of college in the same career field, same location, are getting paid 7% less than the men. And when you start saying that's 7% less than you're going to get to pay your college loan or maybe buy an apartment or whatever, their eyes light up. So, and in Northern Virginia, we've done um, the elect her and we're very involved with all the different campuses of NOVA and of course throughout the state. So we have a good relationship with the, the colleges. Your executive director, Lisa Matz. Lisa Matz. Lisa Matz is amazing. Yes. Well, I see her quoted everywhere. Like, yes. like yep. I see, She's public policy. Public policy, policy because I see, when I see articles about women, women yes. in politics, women vote, women's issues, she is often quoted, and Absolutely. she seems to be an extremely articulate, knowledgeable person on these issues. You have to, read, like with 107, we have something called the Two Minute Advocate, that we could put out an issue to all the uh, members of AAUW and all the supporters and say, this is the issue we're, we're porting on. Send this, it's automatically all set up, and it will go to your congressperson or your senator. And I lobby, I've been lobbying now for three years up in Congress, and in fact, uh, Representative Kilpatrick of Arizona, when we were in her outer office, she heard the words AAUW and came out of her office and thanked us and said, what a great job we're doing. So AAUW is nonpartisan. Uh, we just want things that protect women and girls, um, acts and legislature passed. But we're a power up there. Um, no, I can. It, it's I, a volunteer lobby corps. It's not a paid lobby yeah, corps. Yeah, right, right, from, right. From, from Virginia and Maryland. Like I said, I was very impressed. I was standing in line with a bunch of women from AAUW at session last year when I was down in Richmond and got into a long conversation about what they were there for. And mm -hmm. they're just, you know, there's, there's strength in numbers. That's Being right. well organized is the key to anything, to be mm -hmm. unified, turn out your members to make sure people understand the strength of being able to turn out a membership that is that large. Now you said something about there's being a lobbying every Thursday on the Hill. We have a lobby called Volunteer that we just celebrated our 40th anniversary. Wow. And they go up there um, every Thursday, Congress is in session, and the national group get, says, here's where we're going, this is the bill, we're gonna either get a co-sponsor or get somebody to vote for you. have. It's very well organized, and we go to the House of the Senate, and it's interesting. We usually try to see one of the, um, the chief of staff or somebody on the committee to, and get some sort of commitment. Um, but we, uh, in fact, we just celebrated Title IX and Lobby Corps, and we had Nancy Pelosi there as one of the speakers, and again, shook our hands and said, you guys are doing a great job. So we are a force, and with the Congress and is being a little, there's, there's not a lot of action going on. So it's becoming critical that we look at the state and local elections and, and level to get uh, legislation passed. So that's why we're really teaming up and really excited about this, having candidates from each of the Fairfax districts, because this is where action is happening. It's true, and the, you know, the thing about being a nonpartisan organization that's vote, uh, focused on issue advocacy is mm -hmm. that you have to have members from both parties. It will not work. If you mm -hmm. can't convince right. people in both parties, you will not get the advocacy yeah. that you seek. And so I think it's very important 
that you're very clear about the fact that you advocate on issues right. and mm -hmm. you are nonpartisan right. and you'll knock on everybody's door. It doesn't matter what flavor you are. That's I mean, right. we visited every senator's office last year, all 100 of them, and all our research and all our reports are footnoted. So this is not something that we're just making up. These are coming from, you know, uh, the Department of Housing or the Department of Education or so on. And we have this facts. And so we're well known that way. And I think we're, we've been involved at Fairfax level. We've gone to the proclamation for human trafficking and yeah. pay, and, and we've been involved with the Commission on Women. So uh, we're excited. We just hope everybody goes to the meet and greets, listens to their candidates. I don't care who you vote for, just vote. Because the suffragettes really went through hell right here in Fairfax County. <laughs> yes, they did. And that when our next guest coming up I is know. going to explain why we in Fairfax County need to care about this because the the genesis of the movement and when, when the rubber met the road, it was at, at the Occoquan Workhouse mm -hmm. under right. Woodrow Wilson. And there are women who went to bat for us. And it is disappointing that we do not have women who are um, more engaged. On the other hand, having been a single mom for a long time of three school-age kids, mm -hmm. I also understand that it's one more thing on women's plates. Yes. And, and that's one of the reasons I think women who are in the middle of their careers, like between college and getting to empty nester, it's very difficult to grab the attention of women who are working and have kids and they have uh, the other issues, but we need them. Mm -hmm. We need their voices because so many of the fair pay, the, you know, there's no, we haven't had the universal child care was killed in 1972 on the Hill, and we haven't had a discussion about it since then. It's the whole issue with um, paid sick days. Yes. Something like 70% of, of, of workers for the hospitality and food workers do not have any paid sick days. So if they're sick or their children are sick, they lose money. They, they lose money, yes. It, well, they don't lose money, they come they in. Don't get it. Yeah. And then it, we get all sick. Yeah, so, yeah, you true, know. Yeah. It, 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 these are the challenges, and you're right. It's at every level. People need mm -hmm. to understand that your board of supervisors makes a huge difference. And the, your constitutional officers, your House, your Senate, right on up to the, everybody's kind of focused on the presidential election already after that debate <laughs> on Thursday. Oh my goodness, the debate on Thursday. My biggest problem with that one was Carly Fiorina was not on that stage. Yeah. I mean, that's my takeaway was that it's 2015 and that party, in my opinion, should not have been presented with such a limited field when there are is a qualified candidate. Yeah. But apparently she won really big. They said afterward Still it was talking our yeah, about her, right? <laughs> she won pretty big. But I do think, you know, even John McCain said that the only grown ups during the, the shut, government shutdown, the only grown ups were the women of the Senate. And to hear somebody, a veteran, a legislator, say something about the different way in which women work together and collaborate and the fact that we need more of those voices, we truly do, for the issues mm -hmm. that we care right. about. Okay. I mean, and so a lot of times, I, you know, I get hit hard because I talk a lot about electing more women and people are like, gender shouldn't matter. I'm like, it's a different lived experience. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's not call it gender. Let's say we need people with a different lived experience sitting in policy making positions. And I so appreciate the work that you guys are doing. I mean, again, organization is key. You've got a great message, great research, you've organized, you lobby. I'm so impressed with your reach and the depth and 18, the 1800s you've been 1881, doing 1881. Yeah, 1881 is incredible. Not me personally, but. Yeah. No, I didn't, and I would <laughs> never have said that. <laughs> would never have even, even intimated that. But, no, you know, I you. appreciate the long-term work that you have been doing. And we are going to come back after this, this break, and we're going to talk to the, uh, the Turning Point Women's Suffragist Memorial. So please join us after the break. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you, Patsy, for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I need a job. Necesito trabajo. I would like to speak English better. Me gustaría hablar inglés mejor. I want to be a U.S. citizen. Quisiera ser ciudadano de los Estados Unidos. For over 35 years. Por más de 35 años. The Hispanic Committee of Virginia has been serving our community. El Comité Hispano de Virginia ha estado sirviendo a nuestra comunidad. Job training and placement. Capacitación. Ayuda para conseguir trabajo. Education for children and adults. Educación para niños y adultos. Immigration, naturalization, and medical referrals. Ayuda para los procesos de inmigración y naturalización y orientación sobre médicos are a small part of what we do. son solo una pequeña parte de lo que hacemos. For help, information, or to volunteer. Para ayuda, información 
o para ofrecerse como voluntario. Contact the Hispanic Committee of Virginia. Comuníquese con el Comité Hispano de Virginia. Helping everyone participate more fully in American society. Ayudando a todos a participar plenamente en la sociedad norteamericana. Did you notice if you were missing half your kidney function? According to the National Kidney Foundation, 20 million people have chronic kidney disease and 20 million more may be at risk and not even know it. Anyone with high blood pressure, diabetes, or family history of chronic kidney disease is at risk. Early diagnosis is vitally important. To get the whole story, talk to your doctor and visit the National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org or call for a free brochure. Because when it comes to chronic kidney disease, you might not know the half. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to our last segment of Inside Scoop. Joining me in this segment is Pat Worth, the Executive Director of the Turning Point Suffragist Memorial, and Kathleen Pablo, who came to my Rotary Club actually about two months ago and gave a wonderful presentation um, as a suffragist. And I'm going to let um, these ladies actually start out by explaining the difference between suffragette and suffragist because we've got a movie with Meryl Streep coming out very soon about suffragettes and how are suffragists different? The suffragettes are the British women who were very radical, very aggressive in their tactics. The American suffragists declined to use the ETTE feminine diminutive ending. They said there's nothing diminutive about us, and they've always included men in the group. Well, that's a tremendous distinction. And I think a lot of people don't realize that Woodrow Wilson, who uh, is a Virginia president, we have seven of them, and a lot of people are like, oh, League of Nations, Woodrow Wilson. But he wasn't really all that in a box of chocolates, was he, Kathleen? Uh, not really, no. He was uh, caught by the politics of the time. He was elected by the eight southern states in Arizona. And he knew he'd lose his base if he supported suffrage. And people really were calling women insane. I mean, they were actually institutionalizing women. We were crazy. That's right. You know, the, the Night of Terror. And I think Iron Jawed Angels, and a lot of people are not familiar with that documentary, really talks about what happened to the women when they were removed as silent sentinels outside the White House and taken to the Occoquan workhouse. And brutalized. And brutalized. For nearly two weeks. And you, if you go online to your computer and look at awesomestories.com, Google Alice Paul, you can see clips from that movie. Go to the force feeding in Occoquan, and it will give you a very good taste of what happened. Yeah, it was, it was very brutal. And so this, this memorial, Pat, that has been in the works, explain how this came about through the park system. And it's an interesting story about the uh, genesis of the Turning Point Suffragist Memorial. Well, it really is. I mean, Virginia is a remarkable state. We are just oozing with all kinds of history. And the uh, ratification of the 19th Amendment is something that was, uh, there was a definite drama that played out here in Virginia. Um, about seven years ago, the uh, Nova Parks came to the we, uh, League of Women Voters in Fairfax and said, we think we have a great idea. Uh, what do you think about having a memorial to the suffragists in the Occoquan Regional Park? And the reason for that location is because, as you were just talking about, during the suffrage movement, there were a number of women who had been picketing the White House, and they were hauled off to the Occoquan Workhouse, which uh, the Occoquan Regional Park is part, of, was, is part of what was the prison grounds where these women were incarcerated. And um, they formed a committee, and then they formed a 501c3. We are a nonprofit organization. We are a nonpartisan or organization. And our purpose is to commemorate the literally thousands of women who for 72 years 
worked to gain suffrage for women. This didn't just start, this wasn't an overnight thing that happened. There had been a, a gathering in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, and it took 72 years from that point in time until the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And there were literally thousands of women from across the country who uh, advocated for suffrage. It was a very, very hard and long fought process. Um, and it, incredibly to many of us who are learning more and more about this, nothing was ever done to recognize these women. And yet what happened in addition to the ratification of the 19th Amendment, as our, one of our um, historians likes to say, is that not only did women obtain the vote with ratification of the 19th Amendment, but it was actually when women, American women, entered the Constitution. Because prior to the ratification of the 19th Amendment, women really weren't included in the Constitution. They were property. Wow. Yeah, wow, how about that? You know, I think it was one of the, one of the seminal moments for me of uh, President Obama's second inaugural address when he made reference to Seneca, Selma, and Stonewall. Because again, a, a sitting president in his inaugural address referenced Seneca Falls and the fact that that really was sort of the genesis of the movement and it took so long and so many women's lives and men's too were dedicated to trying to get the right to vote. And, and I think young people, and I think we've talked about the Institute that we hope to be part of this memorial. That's right. The young women, because they certainly don't see it in their history textbooks. You know, American history taught in the classrooms today. No. <laughs> now, um, we, it, uh, our mission um, is kind of twofold. Number one, our mission is to build this memorial so that we actually have a place where the entire suffragist story will be told. And where the name Turning Point comes from is when we look at all of the suffragist organizations that worked toward ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, as uh, Kathleen mentioned a few moments ago, there were a number of them who were incarcerated in the, at the workhouse. And they were inhumanely treated, and they were beaten, and they were force-fed, and they were kept in inhumane conditions. And when word of that started to leak out, it became a significant turning point in getting the president to go to Congress and say, I really think it's about time that we look at doing something about this. You have an interesting slide in your presentation which I hope to get on a future show, about the headlines internationally and the fact that somebody got word out of what was going on in that Occoquan workhouse. Yes, Rose Winslow smuggled out notes on toilet paper and a matron with a conscience passed them to the outside. And when news hit the press, it went around the world. And there was international indignation that a president of the United States making wartime speeches about democracy would do that to his own citizens. Isn't that remarkable how people kind of manage to rationalize this? You know, a lot of people don't realize too that here in, this, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, it took 32 years for our legislature to ratify the 19th Amendment. It was 1952. Right. But there were seven states after us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, small consolation, Kathleen, small <laughs> consolation. And, but just the resistance is quite amazing to me. And, and, and I think there is a lack of appreciation for not just the women in the movement, but so much of, we've had guests from the AEUW and the Fairfax County Council of PTAs and from the League of Women Voters today who are able to do what we're able to do That's right. because, because of, of, of what these women did. We exactly all have right. the life we have That's right. because of what these women did. And there is no memorial, there's no history, no. there's no t retelling of their story. That's right, and, ca and later this month on August 26th, is the 95th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Women in this country have not even had the vote for 100 years yet, which, which is just mind boggling. But we hope to have this memorial built in time for that centennial celebration. Um, we do have some pictures of um, the design and hopefully we can put them up at some point while we're here today. But, on, um, but what, one of the things that we're doing that's kind of fun is um, on the 24th, we are having what we're calling a, um, a, a Twitter party. 
And people can, we were asking people to look at the movie Iron Jawed Angels. Oh, look, and they've just flashed up what is, this is the design. This is the rendering for this the is, memorial. Th this is not the memorial. This no. is actually not the memorial. This is actually, what's happening in Occoquan Regional Park is, it's, it's in addition to our memorial being built there, there you go. In addition to the memorial being built there, the um, Park Authority is redeveloping the uh, whole entire park into a cultural center. And what, and what this picture is, is of the Gene R. Packard Center, which is wonderful because part two of our mission is to have the um, memorial built. It's a garden style memorial. And this is, Catherine, by the way, a national memorial. This right. isn't a this local is not memorial. Virginia, this, not is a Virginia. this is a national memorial. Very, very important. But part two is we want, our, our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower um, present and future generations to stay vigilant about equal rights. Because we already know that we don't have full equality in everything right now. So we've got to keep looking at equal rights. And so we are, uh, once the memorial is built, our goal is to set up a program. And for now, we're calling it the Turning Point Institute. And it's, um, I think its theme will be empowerment because we want to bring in youth, particularly w young women, and teach them things like leadership uh, skills, public speaking, um, social responsibility. Uh, it, 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 so it, these classes will hopefully become a turning point in their lives to empower them to be successful just like the suffragists before them. We will look at those skills that those suffragists use to become um, leaders. Yeah, <laughs> and, and they shape the nation. Exactly. So in the, exactly. in the few minutes that we have left, we need to cut to the chase. This costs millions of dollars. It's a Correct. national memorial. Right. You've got benchmarks to meet. Yes, we do. There's ways for people to donate, to contribute, to participate. Yes. Tell us how we do it. Well, if you go to our website, which is suffragistmemorial.org, you can um, uh, you can donate. We have a donate button on there, and donating is terrific. Um, on September 17th, we are hosting a fundraising dinner. It's a Silent Sentinel Award dinner. And once again, the Silent Sentinels were the women who were picketing in front of the White House who were hauled off to prison for doing that. And we're having a Silent Sentinel dinner. And so we, uh, we have room for about 200 people. So, and it's going to be tremendous because we've got um, Jan Fox is going to be our MC. We've got Rebecca Cooper is going to be doing the award. Our Silent Sentinel um, awardee is um, Margaret Peggy Richardson. She was a former commissioner for the Internal Revenue Service. Um, we've got um, uh, Edie Mayo, who is emeritus. Um, Curator Emeritus of the Smithsonian is going to be one of the speakers. I mean, we have just, it's going to be a phenomenal evening. It's going to be very exciting. A lot of really important people are going to be there. So that's something that's coming up. And uh, like I said, we have this tweet party that we're having, and we are going to be telling people how they can donate during that. That will be on August 24th, and we're asking everybody to look at the movie at 7.30 in the evening. We're just asking people to find and either order it, or you can do, get it off of... Um, uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime. Yeah, yeah, you can get it off of there. YouTube, I think, as well. And we're going to be tweeting throughout the movie to explain what's going on historically. Oh, I think that's fantastic. You've also got something called the Founder Circle, too, trying to encourage people to be one of the founding members that's of the right. memorial. That's right, a giving circle type of a, of a project. And, um, and so, for example, if um, the AAUW that was just here, if they wanted to start their own giving circle, what a they, idea. Yeah, what a marvelous idea. They could donate $1,000 to set it up, and then they could ask their members to donate to that particular giving circle. Uh, one of our national, other national uh, groups is the League of Women Voters. They are supporting us. Um, the National Association of Women Business Owners is supporting us. We've got a lot of national organizations that are supporting us as well. That's fantastic. And for anybody who wants Kathleen, she does a fantastic presentation. She came to my Rotary Club and organizations who really want to know exactly what happened, who was involved, who these women are, Kathleen is the person that you want to come out.